हेलो फ्रेंड्स माई सेल डॉक्टर रुचिका गर्ग इन दिस लेक्चर वी विल बी स्टडिंग अबाउट वॉट इज प्री एग्लैम्शिया और प्रेगनेंसी इंड्यूस्ड हाइपर टेंशन सो हाइपर टेंशन दैट डेवलप्ड एज अ डायरेक्ट रिजल्ट ऑफ ग्रेविट स्टेट इट इंक्लूड्स प्री एक्लैम्शिया एक्लैम्शिया और जस्टेशनल हाइपर टेंशन सो हाइपर टेंशन इज डिफाइंड एज वेन द ब्लड प्रेशर इज मोर दैन वन फोर्टी बाई नाइन्टी मिलीमीटर ऑफ मर्करी ऑन टू टाइम्स Six hours apart in a previously non-motensive and non-proteinuric patient after twenty weeks of pregnancy. So proteinuria is the urinary excretion of more than three hundred milligrams of protein in twenty-four hours. Now coming to gestational hypertension. Gestational hypertension, there is no proteinuria. and now chronic hypertension the patient is having hypertension before 20 weeks of pregnancy that is she is a known hypertensive either before pregnancy or the first time before 20 weeks of pregnancy so preeclampsia is basically a multi system disorder of unknown etiology characterized by development of hypertension to the extent of 140 by 90 mm of mercury or more with proteinuria after 20 weeks of pregnancy in a previously normotensive and non proteinuric patients preeclamptic features may occur before 20 weeks in cases of hydatiform mole acute polyhydramnios and also in cases of multiple pregnancies so what are the risk factors for preeclampsia primary gravida first time exposure to chorionic villi then there is family history then placental abnormalities like in cases of diabetes molar pregnancy obesity insulin resistance pre existing vascular disease or thrombophilias so what is preeclampsia it is a multi system disorder of unknown etiology characterized by development of hypertension to the extent of 140 by 90 mm of mercury on two occasions 6 hours apart in a previously normotensive and non proteinuric patient after 20 weeks of pregnancy if it is not proteinuria then no proteinuria is there then we call this as gestation hypertension and there are two conditions in which preeclampsia can occur before 20 weeks that is high deform mole acute polyhydramnios in multiple pregnancy so risk factors we have seen it occurs in primary patient family history or those who are having thrombophilias those who are obese those who are hypertensive pre existingly so etiopathogenesis the basic etiopathogenesis is endothelial dysfunction and intense vasospasm vasospasm leading to damage of the capillary endothelial system normally in the first trimester normally in the first trimester trophoblast invades up to the decidua and in the second trimester up to myometrium because the spiral arteries they transform into low resistance low pressure and high flow system in preeclampsia there is failure of second wave of endotrophoblastic migration leading to reduction in blood supply of the fetoplacental unit so what happens is uh, these um spiral arteries are converted into large bore capillaries which are capable of taking the intense blood flow which occurs during the pregnancy the blood flow is increased in pregnancy the placental blood flow is should be increased so these normal spiral arteries they should be converted into capillaries with the wider diameter so for that um, the trophoblast invades into it but the invasion is up to decidu in the first trimester and the second wave of trophoblastic invasion occurs around 16 weeks of pregnancy but this second wave of trophoblastic invasion is absent in cases of preeclampsia so these capillaries fail to convert into large bore capillaries so there is vasospasm as you can see the spiral arteries they are converted into normal pregnancy because of this trophoblastic invasion okay the cytotrophoblast it secretes the beta hcg it's blue in color and the 
sorry syncytotrophoblastic reads the beta HCG it is blue in color and this is this trophoblastic invasion of the cytotrophoblastic cells. But it occurs up to residua and then up to the myometrium but in cases of free eclampsia it fails to occur. So, these spiral arteries they are not converted into white bore capillaries they, they remain the same. So, they are not able to accommodate the excess blood flow of pregnancy. So, other things are endothelin 1 nitric oxide which is a vasodilator, cytokines, oxidative stress like interleukin 6, TNF alpha these all contribute to the etiopathogenesis of free eclampsia. So, non severe PET is BP more than 140-90, but severe PET is BP more than 160 by 110 millimeters of mercury along with severe proteinuria, oligouria, urine output less than 400 ml in 24 hours, platelet count less than 1 lakh per millimeter cube along with health syndrome, cerebral and visual disturbances, persistent severe epigastric pain and retinal hemorrhages. So, if the blood pressure is more than 160 by 110 millimeters of mercury along with these changes like epigastric pain, headache, visual disturbances, low platelet count, severe proteinuria and the patient is having oligouria, retinal hemorrhages, then we classify it as severe preeclampsia. So, from the history it can occur in primary along with diabetes with pre-existing hypertension, mild symptoms like edema, sight swelling over the ankles which persist even on rest because slight physiological edema of pregnancy is there. But if there is edema which persists even on rest, swelling gradually increases and extend to the face and then abdominal wall, vulva and even the whole body like the parite abdominal wall. So, these are alarming symptoms, epigastric pain, headache, blurring of vision, diminished urine output. So, what are the signs? Abnormal weight gain. The patient will say that uh, her fingers have turned tight, the ring in the fingers or the shoes are tight, a rapid weight gain is there, blood pressure rise, then edema and along with that the, pl since the placental perfusion is reduced, the patient will be having decreased blood supply to the placenta leading to oligohydramnosus cantilicar along with growth restriction in the fetus as intrauterine growth restriction. So, what investigations we have to do? We far to along from the CBC, we have to go for a urine test for proteinuria, ophthalmoscopic examination should be done for retinal edema and constriction of arterioles and uh, serum uric acid should be done that is renal function test should be done if it is more than 5 gram per deciliter even blood urea may increase, serum creatinine may be increased showing renal dysfunction as the patients may land into health syndrome, hemolysis, elevated liver enzyme and low platelet count. So, these patients may have liver function test should be done, platelet count should be done, coagulation test should be done and fetal monitoring frequency should be increased because these patients may uh, land into severe preeclampsia and heart rate disturbances. So, what are the complications? Maternal. So, during labor these patients may have eclampsia, purpurium also shock sepsis may occur, IUGR may occur. So, these patients are more prone to birth asphyxia and preterm labor, preterm labor may be iatrogenic. Now, what is HELP syndrome, hemolysis, elevated liver enzyme and low platelet count? Liver enzyme SGOT, SGPT are elevated and platelet counts are less than 1 lakh. Remote complications, normally these preeclampsia comes to normal within 6 weeks of delivery, but the, uh, some patients may have residual hypertension. So, if there is residual hypertension, it points towards two things that either it is a family history or maybe underlying thrombophilia might be with the etiology or in 25 percent cases, there may be recurrent preeclampsia. So, what are the screening tests with which we can predict 
it is pre, uh, pre eclampsia in doppler ultrasound in 20 around 20 weeks of pregnancy there is persistence of diastolic notch in the uterine artery if it is so we can predict that these patients may land into preeclampsia that is around 20 weeks of pregnancy we do a color doppler examination of the uterine artery normally the diastolic notch disappears because there is increased blood flow so the notch uh, to notch disappears to accommodate the increased blood flow in the uterine arteries but if it is persist these patients have more tendency to uh, land into preeclampsia now absence of end diastolic frequencies and first occurs a diastolic notch then there is absent end diastolic flow then reverse diastolic flow mean arterial pressure is more than 90 millimeters of mercury rollover test is done between 28 to 32 weeks so the patient is laid from side to back position and there is a rise in diastolic blood pressure of more than 20 millimeters of mercury it indicates a positive rollover test it indicates a renin angiotensin mechanism and also the inferior vena cava is compressed because of the gravid uterus and presence of free cell free DNA in the maternal serum in early pregnancy there are many other tests to predict preeclampsia like endoglin and SFLT which are quite costly but they are very effective even pregnancy associated plasma protein A, PAP A, endoglin and SFLT we should remember. Now what are the prophylactic measures those who are prone they should have regular antenatal checkups and more frequency of antenatal checkups if there is a previous history of preeclampsia or she has a family history of preeclampsia or she is obese. Then high dose calcium supplementation of up to 2 grams per day is found to be effective in prevention of preeclampsia. Now presence of antioxidants vitamin C, E, zinc, magnesium, fish oil, antithrombotic agents, low dose aspirin 60 milligram daily in the early pregnancy. According to the CLASP study low dose aspirin from the first trimester in high risk patient should be given low molecular weight heparin may be given in patients with thrombophilias. So, management we will study in the next slide.